Hello, Biology 300 students. This is Mr. Gales. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the cell cycle in mitosis. This is screencast session number one. If you're in Mr. Parker's or Miss Wolf's biology classes, you're going to use the same materials that my students are using. If you happen to have a different biology teacher, um, a lot of the materials that we'll use are very similar, but you may have some slight differences from what we're uh, using. As we get started today, make sure that you've got your two-column two note paper ready so that you can take your notes, or if you've already taken your notes, make sure that you have them out so you can review them as we go through this screencast. Uh, now I'm going to move forward to the next slide here that has the learning targets for the screencast. As we watch this screencast and go through the presentation, you should be able to define somatic cells and give an example. Uh, there will be several that we'll talk about. You should provide at least three reasons why cells divide. You should be able to explain what a chromosome is and what one is made up of. You should be able to describe the relationship between DNA, histones, chromatin, and chromosomes. You should be able to explain what the diploid number means, and you should be able to identify the components of a double-stranded chromosome. Okay. So as we go through this video, just make sure that you're paying attention to those learning targets, and at the end of the video, we'll come back and review uh, and see how you did. I'm going to begin here with a short video clip. This video clip introduces the notion of cell division and kind of explains why it's important. So as the video plays, I'd like you just to listen for why cells divide. Nearly every organism that is made up of many cells begins life as the single cell of a fertilized egg. That single cell divides over and over again until eventually an embryo is formed that is made up of trillions of cells of many different types. Over time, the embryo develops into a baby. And even at a very young age, some of the baby cells begin to wear out. In fact, in a typical human being, every second of every day witnesses the death of about 50 million cells. Therefore, new cells must be constantly produced to replace old, dead, and damaged cells. For cells to reproduce themselves, whether in a developing embryo or in a fully grown adult organism, certain definite steps must be followed to assure that the new cells will contain exactly the same genetic material or genes that were originally present in the parent cell. And the essential process underlying the reproduction of cells is called mitosis. Mitosis is defined as the duplication and division of the nucleus of a cell and its chromosomes during cell reproduction. Scientists recognize four distinct stages of mitosis. First is prophase, second is metaphase, third is anaphase, and fourth is telophase. An average of about 6% of a cell's total lifespan is spent in these four stages of mitosis while the other 94% of its life is spent in a stage that is not considered to be a part of mitosis called interphase. All right, so as the video played, you were sort of introduced to the life cycle of the cell. You saw the various phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and the major life uh, stage of the cell, which is interphase. But really the big idea was why cells divide. So there were some ideas mentioned there. Uh, you may have heard something about growth. You may have heard something about repair to damaged cells. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But before we do uh, discuss why cells divide, I want to talk about the kinds of cells that we're discussing. We're looking at somatic cells. Somatic cells are the cells that make up the body of an organism. The word somatic comes from the Latin word soma, which means body. There are some examples of somatic cells that are here on the screen. The picture on the left-hand side here is of neurons, nerve cells, which are examples of body cells. These are red blood cells, which are also somatic. Uh, additionally, somatic cells examples could include muscle cells, bone cells, skin cells. Generally speaking, somatic cells are any cells that are not involved in sexual reproduction. So we're talking about all the cells of the body except for sperm or egg. Even plants te technically have somatic cells or body cells, even though we don't think about plants having bodies. Here we have the uh, picture of a, of a series of Elodea cells. You might recognize them from the cell lab that we did. Uh, those are also somatic. They're not involved in reproduction. So when we talk about cell division in this unit, we're really looking at the division of these somatic cells. So why do cells divide? 
Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, first of all, some organisms are very simple and reproduce asexually. So the way they, they, the way they reproduce is through simple cell division. Another reason that cells may divide is for growth. If you noticed at the beginning of the video, it mentioned that we all start off as a single fertilized egg, and over time as our cells divide, we grow by producing more and more new cells. Repair of damage. Uh, as we damage our cells, we get cuts or, bru or bruises or break bones. The way our bodies repair that damage is by producing new cells. Development. Uh, this is another characteristic of living things where by living things change their physical characteristics. This occurs during the development of new cells, the division of new cells. Certain chemical signals are turned on and those cells begin to develop and change differently. Surface area to volume ratio. This is another major reason that cells divide. If a cell were to get too large, the surface area to volume ratio decreases and the cell becomes less efficient. Small cells are more efficient because they have more surface area for the same volume. Uh, so what happens is as a cell gets to a certain size, there's a chemical signal that's sent to the nucleus that says that it's time to divide, and so that cell splits in two. Each of the new cells starts off very small, and then as a course of its life, it grows, and then it too will reach that, that point where it reaches a size where it needs to divide. Now the final reason, and probably the most important for our presentation here, is cells divide to maintain the correct number of chromosomes from generation to generation. Human beings have 46 chromosomes in each of our somatic cells, and so when our cells divide as we produce new cells, it's important that we get that same number of chromosomes. And speaking of chromosomes, that's our next main idea. Uh, the picture that you see here is a picture of salivary gland, uh, the chromosomes from the salivary glands of fruit flies, and those are used as a research model because they're real puffy, they're easy to, to observe, and you can see here very clearly the distinct bands, the segments, or the regions of uh, different kinds of DNA that's present. Chromosomes are structures that contain the genetic material. Uh, these are easily stained structures inside the nucleus. Um, now what I'd like you to do is, if you've got your unit packet, we're going to flip over real quickly and look at it for uh, on page 39. Now if you're in my class, Miss uh, Wolf's class, or Mr. Parker's class, this is page 39 of your unit booklet for cell division. And again, if you have one of the other biology teachers, it's likely that you have uh, a page very similar to this. We're going to look at uh, a drawing which shows the construction of chromosome structure. Okay. So in this picture, we see a double-stranded chromosome. And these kinds of chromosomes are visible during a process called mitosis, which is the division of the nucleus. Each chromosome during this division phase is made up of two identical parts called sister chromatids. And those two sister chromatids are held together at a structure called the centromere, which you see here. Now, in human beings, we have approximately six feet worth of DNA in each one of our cells. And it's pretty amazing that we can get all that DNA to fit in. The way that happens is, our, our DNA molecule is wrapped very tightly around proteins that are called histone proteins. And that coiling of those proteins in DNA is further supercoiled, and eventually that gets coiled up into the material that we call chromatin, which eventually forms chromosomes. All right, so that diagram really focuses in on structure of, of chromosomes. We're going to jump back out into the presentation here and move on to the next slide. I uh, mentioned the word chromatin there. When we look at chromosomes like we see here, this is the common chromosome that you would recognize from cell division, those chromosomes are composed of chromatin, which is a mass of DNA and those histone proteins, which are used to wind them up tightly into a compact shape. During the majority of the cell's life, the genetic material exists as this chromatin material. You cannot see it. It's indistinct in the nucleus. Only during cell division can you actually see chromosomes. So again, this DNA double helix wound tightly around the histone proteins to form structures called nucleosomes, which are then further coiled into the chromatin. Now the next concept that we need to talk about referencing chromosomes is something called the diploid number. Uh, when we talk about the diploid number, we're looking at the full number of chromosomes found in the somatic cell of an organism. And we can sometimes, or sometimes you'll see this abbreviated as 2n, or 2 times the number of chromosomes. Another way of looking at the diploid number is that uh, the diploid number represents two of each chromosome or a pair. And the reason that we have a pair of each of our chromosomes 
is we get one from our mother and one from our father. Any type of organism that is sexually reproducing is going to have diploid uh, sets of chromosomes in their somatic cells. Okay, now uh, actually before we go into this, I'm going to go back one screen uh, and I'm going to have you again go to a diagram. And so again, if you are in one of our classes, this is going to be page 40 in your packet. And one misconception that a lot of students have is that the more complex an organism is, the larger number of chromosomes that it likely will have. And this diagram sort of shows that that's not exactly the case. Uh, these organisms are all sexually reproducing, and you'll notice that they have an even number of chromosomes. That's, again, because they get one from their mother and one from their father. Uh, something as simple as a mosquito has six chromosomes, but think about this. A mosquito can fly, and we can't. So really, what's the complexity there? Uh, Adder's tongue fern, this is a really small little fern plant, has 1,262 chromosomes in it. I would argue that you know we're more complex, but then again, a fern can do photosynthesis, and we can't. Human beings, 46 chromosomes, and uh, uh, amongst our closest living relatives, primates like the orangutan, uh, chimpanzee, and gorillas, they have 48 chromosomes. So, again, the idea that the more complex an organism is, the, number, the, the greater the number of chromosomes is not necessarily the case. Uh, one more additional thing to take a look at is page 41, and this is a karyotype. Uh, karyotype is a picture which shows the contents of the nucleus. The word karyo refers to nucleus. You may remember that from prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. The karyotype is a picture of paired chromosomes. Um, in this picture, you'll see homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes are pairs of chromosomes that are the same size and shape uh, and they would generally carry genes for the same traits. They exist in pairs again because you get one from your mother and one from your father. Okay, that goes back to the concept of diploid. So this karyotype represents a, the contents of a diploid cell. Okay, now going back over to our presentation, we have just a couple more slides to look at. This next slide uh, again shows the relationship between the chromatin and the chromosomes. DNA and protein coiled together forms chromatin, and during the majority of the cell's life, that the, the genetic material exists as this indistinct chromatin material. It's only during the division phases that we can actually see the distinct chromosomes. And what we're going to finish up with here is just to make sure that you've got a good understanding of chromosome structure. This, is, this picture depicts a chromosome after what's called the S phase of the cell cycle. The S phase is when the DNA is duplicated. And so this chromosome consists of two identical parts called sister chromatids, okay, which are here. There's a chromatid here and a chromatid here. And each of those chromatids, they're attached together at this area called the centromere. Now, the, this chromosome is shaped so that there is a shorter arm on the top and a longer arm on the bottom. Different chromosomes have different shapes uh, and also different placements of the centromeres, but they generally have this kind of structure when they're preparing for division or when they're referred to as double-stranded. All right, so as we wrap up this presentation, I want to reflect on the learning targets and make sure that you can uh, describe what chromosomes are, be able to distinguish between or understand the relationship between chromosomes, chromatin, centromeres, chromatids, all of those, those terms that are, were covered there. Uh, talk about the diploid number and its importance and uh, relate the diploid number to some common organisms. So if you've got questions, make sure you write them down, and uh, we'll be addressing those things in class as we move forward, and we'll see you next time in biology.